welcome to our great players of the past lecture. I was really considering doing Magnus Carlsen because it's you know, great players of the past, but I figure I'll go a little bit, you know, it's not even clear he's a great player yet. He was good for what, two, three years? So, yeah, but Rady, now there's a good player. And this is the first um, lecture I'm going to give where the player is uh, also famous for compositions. He's a great problem composer also. So it's not clear where he was born, because not only did they change the country he was born in, they changed the name of the city. And the truth hurts. In fact, I think they changed it more than once. So, um, you know, he was born in, you know, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, you know, Hungary, Austria, Hungary. So, you know, who knows what it'll be called in a few years. And unfortunately, uh, he died at the age of 40 of scarlet fever. And a lot of the guys you know, from 100, 150 years ago, their chess careers didn't go 50 years because they didn't live that long. Um, so you could look up Rady on the internet, either at the Wikipedia article, which I did, where it talks about um, this famous study we're going to look at, notable chess games. He beat many world champions, even though he died at 40. Um, he also composed chess problems, and he wrote chess books. Um, he's considered very good at both. I read a funny article, which may or may not be true, who knows if it's true, which said he completed his doctoral thesis in mathematics and then he lost it. And then he never got it back, and so I don't know. It sounds funny, if, if true. Maybe it wasn't <laughs> funny to him. But anyway, um, then if you go to chess.com, obviously there's uh, the games of Rays. Always have a Wikipedia, chess.com. I thought it was funny, that the picture from chess, chess games and the picture from uh, Wikipedia is slightly different. Yeah, slightly. Um, and then there's also Wikipedia on the Rady opening, and Rady was known, even though he didn't always play like this, for the hypermodern school, which is you give your opponent the center, and then you crush it, and he liked to play C4 and B4 and G3 and B3. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know what the Rady opening is, because a lot of times in these databases, you play knight f3 on move one, it says the radio opening, when opening hasn't been determined yet, so, but it could be the radio opening. Um, and then they talk a lot of the radio opening a lot, and there's even a game of radies. There you go. Um, and they talk about, like, you know, what's going on. Oh, transpositions, that's good. They talk about how can other openings. In fact, I think um, there was a very bad radio today in the game Wesley So versus uh, Dingler in. Although for you it would be two weeks ago, but for us it's today. So, okay. Well, anyway, uh, you can learn a lot about Richard Rady and the um, on the internet because he was a, a good author, problem composer, and chess player. Okay, so there's four positions I wanted to look at for our class. Okay, and this is the famous one that's in the Wikipedia article, in fact, and. Um, when, when this was published in the Detroit newspaper in 1923, although I think he made it up in 1921, um, somebody wrote it and said, you, you have the wrong diagram. They, they couldn't solve it. So um, and this reminds me of a math problem, which we will discuss after we discuss this. So white wants to promote to a queen, and black wants to promote to a queen. And white, of course, can easily be stopped. So yeah, it's easy. And black cannot. And it's funny, there, there's a funny wager that Grandmaster Roman Jinjahashvili likes to make. Um, he takes a bishop and a wrong rook pawn, which is a draw, and he says, I can promote my pawn, I'll bet you anything. And they're like, okay, and they bet, and he does promote his pawn. He didn't say he would win. He said he would promote his pawn. So White could do the same thing. White, white can promote his pawn, so you would lose that bet too if you took it. But um, the bet wasn't that he'd win, the bet was he promote his pawn. So white can promote his pawn, but he'll still lose. So in this instance, um, to draw the game, it's white to play and draw. I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with it, especially my brother who's a master. Um, the king has to go towards this pawn and towards this pawn. Obviously, if white captures the pawn, he draws. And if white can get his king to these squares, he can promote the pawn himself, and queen against queen is a draw. So even if you haven't seen it before, you can guess which move moves the king towards both pawns? G7. Yeah, king G7. Okay, let's play A4. Now move towards both both pawns again. I think we have six. F6. Okay, now 
if it was White's turn to move, he's actually already drawing because King here would would escort the pawn home. So, for example, here and King e6 also also would would draw. Um, King e7, and then I I'm also queening. So yeah, and if you play um, King here, King d7, and we both queen. Hooray! Okay, and this is a draw normally unless of course. You aren't ready? No, if Nakamura was white, then he would go here and, and, and lose the game. So, yeah. I have only made that joke every video. So, it's not a joke, though. Okay, it's funny because I made a video for my channel where obviously I showed Nakamura losing by promoting to a knight against Mamajarov. But I also showed the video where he won by promoting to a knight. And that was against Kramnik in the Olympiad when the U.S. beat Soviet Russia. So, and he had to promote to a knight or he wouldn't win. So, the truth hurts. Okay. So after king g7, h4, king here, black plays king b6. And although you have all seen this puzzle before, we have a, a fine audience today. Uh, if you haven't seen it, this move's hard to find. Have you seen it? Then this move's hard to find. You, you have to continue to move your king towards both pawns. E5? Yeah, and that's the drawing move, yeah. Now, if it's white's move, both of these moves draw. If it was white's move, everything draws. Yeah. So, okay, so obviously if I take, then you're going to lose your pawn. Yeah. And now you go king g2 to be cute. They throw it to a knight, and the king goes here, trapping it. Okay, and then um, if you play a three, uh, h3, then king d6, and once again we both queen. Now, of course, in the 1920s, that was a hard problem. Now, if you invent a chess problem, which I'm sure you've all done, and I'm staring at you at home, too. You just turn the kibitzer on, and then, you know, not only is white drawing, white only has one move that draws, so now you know your problem is good before you submit it. And actually, uh, when I teach chess camp to strong kids, which is rare, about once a year, kids are experts, masters, I make them, during class, compose a problem. And they do it on a chess board, and they, they submit it, mate and two, mate and three, and then I can check on my computer. And if there's one mate and two or one mate and three, then their problem's right. Sometimes their problems are silly, but I give a prize for the best problem. And if they have 300 answers, that's not a good problem. And sometimes they have no answers. Their answer is wrong. I'm like, nope, that doesn't work. And they're like, ah, oh, I missed that. And now you know it immediately with engines. Okay? Now, what this reminds me of is a math problem um, with the king going towards both pawns. So if you're into mathematics, right, which I'm sure you all are, if the king wants to go to this square, it takes seven moves, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you're trying to stop this pawn. However, you could also go seven this way, and you can go seven, you know, the way that you know, Rady intended. So you're still going towards the pawn. And there's a, there's a math problem, uh, which my wife's son Holden solved in less than a minute in his head, uh, where we'll, we'll pretend that Black's king is here because I said so. So your king is on e1, and you want to go to e8, which takes how many moves? Seven. Seven. But there's more than one way to do it. You agree? Absolutely. Yeah. But how many ways are there? You can't count them because there's a lot. But when you realize how many there are, you're like, oh, wow, there's a lot. Yeah, there's hundreds. There's hundreds of ways to get here in seven moves. And to figure out how, you have to do math or a computer program. Either way is good. Is it times seven? What? Two times two power seven? No. That, that don't do it. Yeah. You're fired. Yeah. So there's more than one way to do it, but it's not just like you know three times seven or two to the seventh power. It's you have to do some actual math. Terrible, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes you people want to go here, but you can't. That's not one of the squares you can go to when you. Yeah. So sometimes you have one option. Sometimes you have two options. Sometimes you have three options. And you, you can never have more than three options, right? Otherwise, chess would make no sense. Right. So here you have three options. And then if you're here, you have three options. If you're here, you have three options. If you're here, and so forth. And obviously, if you're here, 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 you have one option. And if you're here, you have one option, and so forth. So you can count them all. Actually, a student wrote them all down. And he became an expert. I couldn't believe it. I even know his name, but I don't want to embarrass him. I'm not going to say Timothy Maroney on camera. I would never say that. 
And he wasn't an high rated player, but he became an expert. He wrote them all in a notebook, and he said that's how many there are. And he was right. He got the right number. Yeah. But the idea is, in chess, if you want to do something, there's more than one way to do it. So I'd like to give this example also. In fact, I'll show you a problem I know. Uh, I, I can't show it to you because the computer won't let me not have kings, but yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll pretend there's no kings on the board, but I have to put kings on the board. So this is a puzzle where you move your knight around the board, and I've shown this before, and you're not allowed to move to a square the queen attacks. The queen attacks this square. So you're just going in order here, then here, then here, then here, and then you go here, then here, then here, and then this is the last square. And so you can't go here because the queen attacks that square, so you go here, so you do this way. Now you go to that square, and you would do it this way. Okay, then you can skip this square because the queen attacks it, and you go here. And actually, well, I can't make more than one move because it makes me move for black. But once you get here, going here is hard because you're not allowed to move to a square the queen attacks. The point is, there's more than one way to do any, anything. You, I could do everything a million ways, but there's a quicker way and there's not a quicker way. And what's funny about chess is, if you have a knight and you want to go one square away diagonally, you can do it in two moves, and there's more than one way to do it. If you want to go two squares away diagonally, that's much more difficult. Much more difficult. And three squares away diagonally is much easier. So you have to realize when you're playing chess that there's more than one way to do things, and sometimes the straight line is only tied for first, that the crazy way is also good. In fact, a good example is when the game of chess starts. Let's get a new board. Uh, yeah. So if you want your knight on g1 to go in the center on d5, seems like a good square, right? One way to do it is to go to h3, which seems crazy, but it's no, nothing's faster. You can also go this way, and you can go this way. Yeah. But I mean, h3 is, the, is tied for the quickest time. <coughs> right, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's, so, um, yeah, so when you solve puzzles, sometimes moves you would never think of, that's almost always the right answer. Yeah. Okay, this is another famous Rady puzzle, which I'm sure you all know. And by all you, I mean my brother knows it. So, and the other three don't, right? Okay, good. So black's going this way, and there's a really good reason why black's going this way. If black was going this way, this wouldn't be a puzzle. This would be black resigning. Okay. But with black going this way, then this, this king isn't so good. That's not good for stopping a pawn. This rook is really well placed to stop the pawn that's in front of it. So of course, if you move your rook to the side and the pawn keeps moving, your rook's not doing anything. Your rook is, is, is hopeless. So... Once I start moving, you better, you better stop my pawn, and you're, you're not going to win because your king is here. So the rook is great, and the thing is the rook is too good, right? And that's why I win a lot of blitz games, because even if my opponents are too good, I'm three good, right? And if you play the obvious move rook to d1, after the move d4, you're in Zugzwang. And you guys know what Zugzwang is, right? Okay, so now 1,300. Yeah. So Zugzwang means a German word, you're, you're compelled to move. And obviously, they're typing now, like, it's not Zugzwang, it's Zugzwang, and they're really mad because the Germans. You ever met a German who was mad before? Okay, yeah. They said my pronunciation was Nazi good. So, I don't know. But anyway, the point is, in this position, White's position is perfect. I can't give White a better position. But if it's White's turn to move, and he makes a quote-unquote waiting move, now he's waiting for black to attack his rook. So that's bad. And now the rook is attacked, so you lose a tempo. Okay, and now the rook is attacked again. And now it's a draw, because the king is over here. So the way to win this position is you want to play rook d1, but you want it to be your opponent's move. And how do you achieve that? It's chest center coffee. Perfect. So you want to play rook d1 in two moves, not in one move. Therefore, you have two answers. Yeah, rook d2 is the intended solution, and it works. And rook d3 also works. Okay, and then after d4, you play rook d1. Now black has to move. Black doesn't want to move because black's king is stopping white's king. So if black's king starts moving, then white's king starts moving. 
and you can't attack the rook because if you play king e2, I'll take your d-pawn. So if you just play very straightforward chess, then I'm just going to go take your pawn. I'm, I'm taking your pawn like very quickly. So the best thing for black to do that's sort of the trickiest is after rook to d2, rook to d1, you can play king to d5. And the idea is if king to f6, trying to run the king, we play king e4, which blocks out the king. And this is also a draw. What's the only winning move for white? If you don't like my answer, you'll be the opposition. And wait, did I say hint out loud? Mm -hmm. King d7. And once again, if it's white's turn to move here, it's a draw, but it's black's turn to move. That's what Zugzwang is. You, you, it's your turn to move, and you have a compulsion to move, but you don't want to. And now, whichever way you go, the opponent goes the other way. Okay, so if he goes here, you go here, and nothing, nobody's stopping you, and so forth. Now, what's funny is, many, 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 many years ago, when chess engines weren't very good, I put this on a chess engine. Now, that's pointless. It just says made in like one second. That's, but... I figured when engines were no good, maybe you couldn't solve it. So I put it on the engine, and this is 20 years ago, I don't know, whenever the engine started, and it's announced made in one second. So it didn't matter. And the reason is there's no legal moves. When you play an opening in a middle game, you both have 20 or 30 legal moves. So to analyze 10 moves ahead is very difficult. But here analyzing 10 moves ahead is nothing for a computer. There's no legal moves. It's like five each. So anyway, you turn an engine on, and it's like, you know, you show me this problem, are you kidding? So it immediately sees these moves win by force, and then it announces mate. And then it'll announce quicker mates as it looks deeper. And it sees rook d2, and it, says, it sees rook d1 doesn't win. Although it prefers white by point, because it works better than a pawn. Yeah. But it sees, and it's funny, it says rook d1, d4, and it, it gives the line we were giving. Yeah. Although I wonder if, if king c5 is the only drawing move. Let's, I, I'm interested. I don't know. And then, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. I'm playing bad on purpose. So after here, this is a draw. Is king c7, is king c, oh, king c5 is the only drawing move. Wow, there's more opposition than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. Yeah, then king d7, king d5 is the only drawing move. Man, chess is hard. Now, of course, we don't need engines for this. You can go to the internet, or you can buy the Nalamov table bases. And all, piece, all positions with six pieces or less have been solved. So you just put this position in and it tells you everything. It tells you every legal move in the result. So this is four pieces. This is a joke. But in the 1920s, this was no joke. If you didn't have an engine, you didn't have table bases, you didn't have a time machine, this problem was hard. Yeah. Now, if this was a tournament game on the internet and grandmasters were playing and they made a mistake, there'd be a thousand guys rated 100 saying, whoa, those idiots, this move wins, because they have their engines and their table bases going. So, in fact, that happened today. Um, Sarah Wan and Hansen, good friends of mine until they watch this video, they were, they were watching the game between Wesley So and Ding Lerin, and they said, man, every move is a blunder. But they're in time trouble and they're nervous. Every move was perfect. And they, they don't use engines when they analyze. Yes, sir, Eric, you better use engines. He has to use engines. He just gives his opinion. And he was like, oh, they should have played this, so they should have played this. And every move they said was wrong. And then the players were playing the right move, so they were totally baffled. Oh, they're just blundering every move. And the engine's like, man, those guys are great. There's a reason why they're 2,800 and they're top five in the world. It's not because they blunder every move. And there's a reason why some guys are commentators and some guys are playing. And you can see which one I'm doing. So, And when I commented, I use my engine because I don't know. Sometimes I do know, but... They were really dissing the players, and I was like, Wesley was down six, minus six, and he drew by playing perfect 40 moves in a row, and his opponent made like one mistake. And they were like, what's Wesley doing? What's Ding doing? I'm like, they're playing the best moves. That's what they're doing. So here, the best move is actually to get the opposition and uh, to put black in Zugzwang by doing this, and now, they, and now the, the black king has to move and let the white king come in. So, yeah, that's funny, king d7. And now we can go... We can go get the pawn, as you can see. Yay, and we take the pawn. And then you want to mate with a rook, right? You guys at home can mate with a rook? Now, what's funny about mating with a rook, which is easy for me, is um, 
Twice today, there was Queen versus Rook. And Queen versus Rook is sometimes hard, sometimes not. And man, those guys that had the Queen, they didn't have any trouble at all. They, they won like with one second on their cloth, like it was nothing. I don't know. It's like 2,800 players are good. I didn't, didn't realize that. Okay, now Rady um, won this game in New York 24 against Capablanca. And this is an interesting game because um, I don't put as much credence in it as most people do, but it's a good story, right? The apocryphal story is what matters. Um, Capablanca didn't lose a game for seven years, which sounds good. I have a lot of friends who haven't lost games in seven years. They don't play. You know, like a V. Friedman he hasn't lost a rated game in like 15 years, but okay, he hasn't played any. Um, I mean, Capablanca played, and he had a lot of draws, but still, he was basically unbeatable. And being unbeatable in the 1920s, that's saying something, because they didn't play 100 moves of theory and agree to a draw like they do now. Unbeatable now is normal. So Rady beat him pretty handily, and Capablanca was the world champion, and the guy never loses. So that's pretty good. I guess he was Rady. Okay, so knight f3, that's the Rady opening, because that's you know, knight f3. Okay, now what Rady liked to do against g6 is not something you see often today with white, because people are silly, but you actually see it a lot with black. Okay, and Rady played the move b4. Um, so he's going to play some King's Indian English type position, but he's going to play b4 right away. And actually, um, some grandmasters are, are getting b5 in early. So for example, after g3, they'll play b5. And they'll feed in Cato, and then they prevented you from playing c4. I mean, they sort of prevented it, because they can take. And this is perfectly, and people play this. Okay, so the fact that Rady played it with white, and then it didn't have a big following. Obviously, the Rady opening is white's usually playing b3, but okay, b4 gains more space, so. Okay, and they played normal game. It just looked like a chess game, except white played b4 pretty early. Now, these kinds of games make me angry, which is easy to do, obviously, okay? Um, and here's why it makes me angry, because a lot of the top players today, they're playing 10, 20, 30 moves of theory, and they agree to a draw five moves later, or zero moves later, depending on who it is. And then you guys go on the internet, and you're like, rawr, chess is boring, and they should play chess 960, and they should play blitz chess, and all the games are draws, and I'm furious. Okay, it is true there's a lot of draws at the top level, but that's more because of who the top players are, and not because chess is a boring draw. For example, you guys play chess, and all your games are boring draws, no, all your games are like, I blunder, you blunder, I blunder, the director shakes his head, and then, you know, one of you wins, and you're like, what, how did I win that game? And I have a lot of students, before I teach them, they think they're great. And I'm like, have you analyzed your games with a good player or an engine? And they're like, what? I don't want to do that, because the truth hurts, right? And if you're going to play bad, and you are, you should try to play better and play less bad. You can still play bad, I'm not against that, but try to play less bad. Now, when you see games like this, where the position never occurred before ever, then you don't have to play 25 moves of Berlin and agree to a draw. You can play interesting chess. There's nothing wrong with it. And the people who do play interesting, like Levon Aronian, have big followings. Yay, Aronian, we love him. Okay? And he has a lot of decisive games, and he has a lot of interesting games. Who else has a big following? Ivan Chuk. He plays really interesting chess, and people love it. Okay? You don't have to go draw, draw. You don't have to. You don't have to play 25 moves of theory. You can just play chess. And I like to play chess for sort of the opposite reason, the avoiding the theory. It's not because I'm avoiding a draw. It's because I don't know any theory. So if my opponent's 1,700 and knows a lot of theory, I don't want to play that. I want to play this, and my opponent's like, what's that? And then they blunder and I win. So avoiding theory has a lot of advantages. The disadvantage, the top players will tell you, is if you avoid theory, you're not playing the best moves. So you're playing worse. If only Hikaru was here to say it's ridiculous. Okay. Castles. But I mean, these moves make sense. They're just chess moves. Just, they've never been played before. Okay. And what's funny about this, even though white played b4 on move 3, confusing the audience, confusing you at home, this looks like a normal position. Like nobody did anything crazy. And what's funny about that is, 
It reminds me of super GMs when they play chess 960. It seems like they're rushing to make the game look normal. And then after like 15 moves, you can't tell it's chess 960 anymore. It's like, yeah, let's make it look like chess so I can play well. So the players are making totally normal, and it looks like a boring position. I would rather have white because it looks like an English opening where I got a b4 for free. And okay, black got e5 in, so. Okay, queen c2, rook e8, not, not very exciting. a5 is a little exciting, okay. And a3 is really important to understand the strategy. I mean, if you play b5, which a lot of you would play, you're giving away the c5 square, and you're not really, you know, you're not really going in for a queen. There's a master in Ann Arbor you've all heard of, when I say all of you, I mean my brother, Dan Boyk, who doesn't play chess anymore. So he's even better than Kappa Boyka. He hasn't lost in like 20 years. Okay. And Dan Boyk, whenever he moves a pawn in the opening, he says, I'm going in for a queen. Because, yeah, he might queen, the, you never know, right? So obviously white wants to queen the pawn and gain space, but you're giving away c5. And the knight going to c5 is nice, and... Rady's like, no, I'm going to keep my pawn on b4, and your knight's never going to c5. Obviously, if you take the pawn, that's very anti-positional, because you're not only giving away c5, but you have an isolated a pawn. So a3 is just a totally standard move. h6, knight f1, that's an unusual move. Wants to go to e3. Now, c5 is very anti-positional, but... Uh, I guess black didn't really have an active plan, and he didn't want to wait for white to just go forward on the queen side later. But I don't like c5, because he's permanently weakening these two pawns. And if it was Bughouse, it would be okay. There's no kids here, so they know what Bughouse is. Bughouse? Yeah. And he's like, what? And you're like, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah Bughouse, you get extra pieces. But okay, here you're weakening everything. And I actually have a name for this that I made up. When the pawn structure is like this, I call it the accordion pawn structure. Okay, it's not, there's no, there's no balance there. So obviously, the white squares are very weak because all of the pawns are on dark squares. So there's no control over these squares. And also, these pawns are weak. They can't be defended by other pawns. So c5 is a pretty anti-positional move. I wouldn't, uh, that's not a move I would play. Okay, b5 is blocking it up because now he can control all the white squares and he doesn't want to give away the c5 square. Kappa Blanca was hoping all these pawns would get traded somehow, and finally the knight would go to c5. And Rady played b5. Okay, now let's see who's the best in the audience. Although I know who the best in the audience is. So now that white's played b5 and given up on opening up the queen side, how is white going to open the game up? What's the long-term plan for white? Anyone? You can say the wrong answer, it's okay. E3, D4. Yeah, that's what I would think. I mean, you, you can't open this up, can't open that up, can't open that up. But okay, the rook's on D1, the queen's on D8. If you've watched my lectures before, I talk about that a lot. That's the file I want open. And coincidentally, white has three pieces that are controlling D4. So E3, D4 makes a lot of sense, okay? All right, so knight f8, the knight's just like white, the knight's going to go to e6 or e3. e3, that, that guy was right. Okay. Queen c7, getting off of this file. d4, see, you're, you're better than Rady. Might be, and yeah, Rady was... Okay, and so white has more space, grandmasters like more space. White has more space on the queen side. These pawns are on the fourth and fifth rank, and white's going forward, and black has two pawns on the third rank that aren't really going to move. And this pawn is getting weak over here. I got a lot of attack on that pawn. Okay, so white has an advantage. Bishop e4 attacking the queen, and Rady didn't see it and hung his queen. Man, it's tough. Now he moved his queen. Queen c3, he took on d4, he took on d4, and he played knight d7. So Kappa Blank is playing for tricks. He likes this scenario here. He's like, I like that this d pawn is pinned. Although, I don't know if I like all these other pieces here. I'm not so sure about that. Rook is pretty good. Okay. Okay, queen d2 getting out of the pin. Makes sense. He takes d4. Now, this is a very anti-positional move, and it's based on tactics. Capablanca wants to play knight c5 to b3, forking the queen and rook. He takes a pawn, 
and he's attacking this pawn. Now, if I can complain about Yasser Serwan, because I've never done that before. Now, Yasser is my good friend. And when Yasser talks about chess, 95% he talks about strategy, and he's correct. So if he saw C takes D4, he would fall out of his chair. He'd be like, ah, horrible, what are you doing? Okay? And most of the time, when very strong players, like Capablanca, make anti-positional moves, it's because of tactics. And the tactics work in their favor and don't matter. If you're up a queen, you can have an isolated pawn, right? You can have a weak king side. So Capablanca decided that after this, the fact that he captured a pawn, wants to capture this pawn, wants to fork the queen and rook, wants to get c5 for his knight, that outweighs all of his silly pawns. He's like, that doesn't matter, I'm doing all this stuff. Okay? And when you're right, you're right. And when you're not right, it's usually okay. So when you're right, you take all your opponent's pieces, and when you're wrong, you're slightly worse. So there's an upside to making anti-positional moves if you calculate them correctly. Okay, bishop takes d4, queen takes c4, Capablanca took a pawn. Not only did he take a pawn, this pawn's not defended. So Saron would be like, oh my god, look at this weak pawn on d6, look at this here, the queen can get under attack. Okay, but then Capablanca's like, I'm going to pawn up, but I'm taking another pawn. Now, on the other hand, the Sarawan likes to take pawns. So I think he would have to retire from, oh, he did retire from chess. Yeah, there you go. Because he would like that black took pawns, and he wouldn't like that black's playing anti-positionally, and may give him all these weak pawns. Okay, bishop g7, king g7, obviously, and queen b2 check. So possibly uh, Capablanca underestimated queen b2 check, because it looks like, you know, this pawn's the pawn that's attacked, but queen b2 check is better. We're dominating this diagonal. We're defending this pawn. This pawn is attacked, and the queen doesn't have a lot of squares to go to. The queen's in white's territory could get attacked. So this was a very strong move. King g8. Rook takes d6. Material equality is established. This pawn's defended. This rook is really aggressively placed. And this queen is on, on a bad square. And usually, in the opening and early middle game, when you're a small child, you move your queen out and you take everything. And you're like, oh boy, that worked out great. And then when you're older and you move your queen out, your opponent takes your queen. You're like, man, that didn't work out at all. And then when you're a super grandmaster, your queen just stays home the whole game and nobody takes it. Like, great. How come he didn't move his queen? Well, nobody took his queen, he didn't move it. So, in general, if it's the first 10, 15, 20 moves of the game, I don't like this queen here. Because white's going to attack it with a lot of different stuff. We got knight d2, we got this knight d2, we got rook c1, we got knight e3, we got rook d4. I'm so confused. Okay, all I see is white attacking the black queen and black not having a lot of squares for it. So I don't like it. Okay, queen c5, he must have heard me. Rook d1, threatening the knight on d7. Rook a7, defending the knight on d7. Knight e3, finally, he played knight f1 like a year ago. And again, in different positions, I would say black's queen is better than white's, but not in this position. In this position, this queen's great, and this queen is just going to get harassed. I don't like that. Also, what would Mark Javoretsky say? Anyone? No? Nobody? He would say, I'm not alive yet, it's 1924. No. Javoretsky has a name for these knights. What does he call them? Also, who's Mark Javoretsky? That's also good. He's the greatest chess coach ever. He calls that the superfluous knights. They're tripping over each other. They can't go to different squares there. Yeah. And this knight is defending this knight, so we can't really play knight e6. And they control fewer squares when they control each other's square. I can't really move either knight. I don't want to lose this pawn. I don't want to lose this knight. So this is a very aggressive attacking stance from white, and black is very passive. Strategically, black's very close to lost here. Okay, so he played queen h5, attacking the knight. Rawr. Good noise, right? Yeah. And knight to d4, because the knight wants to go to what square? D6. Yeah, c6, yeah. And often in, in many openings, when white's played b5 and black's played b6, not very common, c6 is really weak. And when you can put your knight on c6, that's pretty good. 
um, that's too good. But unfortunately, it looks like these bishops are going to get traded. And even if you could take the knight, that's a very strong passed pawn. So the c6 square is weak. Basically, white's infiltrating in black's position. Now, there's a chess coach you've heard of. Well, you've heard of him. Bruce Pandolfini. Anybody? You're nodding. Wow. Right. And, I mean, he's not a good player, but he's a good coach. Okay? Not a good coach either. But, uh, but famous because he was in a movie. He's also in that movie. And in that movie, he talks to himself. The actor talks to the actual person in that movie. Yeah. Searching for, I think it's, it's about Josh Waitzka. I think it's called Searching for Some Chess Talent. And he never found it. Yeah. Anyway, enough about how bad Josh Waitzkin is. Let's get to the point of the, of the lecture. So Bruce Pandolfini, in his videos that he makes, he explains that one way to figure out how you're doing positionally is how many squares in your opponent's territory you're attacking, controlling, and threatening. Now, obviously, black is doing a little bit, you know, a little. Okay, got a little stuff going on here, right? Okay, but, I mean, white's all over black's position. This rook attacks every square. This knight's coming in here. This knight's here. Now, obviously, that's not a real measure, but if you're controlling all the squares in your opponent's territory, that's, that's not good. The squares that black is controlling don't matter because these bishops are going to get traded anyway. So the fact that the bishop, I mean, the bishop could be here too. It's still going to be trading for white's bishop. Okay, he took, and he took. And he played queen e5. So it's possible that when white played knight d4, I don't know, I wasn't there. Maybe you guys, you yeah. uh, It's possible Capablanca mistakenly thought he could take this knight because the knight's defending the rook, right? You see what I'm saying? Removing the defender? Yeah. But that seems to fail to something like this. And I'm threatening mate, and I'm threatening your queen. So, of course, if I turn the engine on and I'm right, then I'm right. Yay. Not sure if knight 96 was better. 96 is worse. Wow. Okay. But it's still winning. Yeah. So you can see rook takes e3 doesn't work. Although the computer plays rook takes e3 anyway to sacks and exchange. And it still says you're doing badly. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. And so he played queen e5. Pinning the knight, and now if you play knight c6, that's tactically unsound. Yasser would still do it. He's like, knight on c6 is great. That reminds me of a funny story. I like stories. In 1988, I went to St. John for obvious reasons. The World Chess Festival in New Brunswick. And I walked into a room where they were playing blitz chess, and they were it was surrounded by a million spectators. And it was Mikhail Tal playing. And I don't know who he was playing. He's playing somebody. And Tall had a knight on d6. He was white. That was a good knight. And he was down a queen for a knight, but his knight on d6 was really good, so he won. Yeah. So maybe knight c6 is good. Yeah. Okay, so Rady played knight c4. Man, those are some good knights. That's the opposite of the superfluous knights is when they're next to each other. If you've memorized all of my videos, which I'm sure you have at home, when I'm black, I often put my knights on f6 and g6 right next to each other. As in like my game with Mama Jara, for example, and Gazzoli, and Conrad Holtz, and so forth. And many, many other games. And I like doing that. I like when the knights are next to each other, because the knights control every square. When they control every square, I'm relatively confident. Right? Even you guys are impressed, right? The knights control a lot of squares, don't they? Yeah. The knights, the knights defending each other, eh, eh. Okay, so obviously the queen's attacked. So we move the queen. Knight c6, obviously, as I indicated. Save the rook. Knight e3. And, well, the knight was attacked. So, yeah, now the black queen could get trapped. No. What a world. Help. Okay, knight e5. Rook d5, because I said so. Remember I told you to play rook d5? Yeah. And then black played the obvious move. It's obvious. Resign. Resign. Good. Yeah, whatever I said, it's resign. Yeah. So that was a funny game because Capablanca was known as their strategical and positional master, and he got totally destroyed. And he didn't lose any material, although now he's losing material. 
I turn the engine on, they always give crazy numbers. They're always really high. Right, material's equal, and it's saying he's plus a lot. Three plus seven if he doesn't play knight c4. Yeah. So not good. There's good and there's not good. Yeah. And supposedly, Capablanca hadn't lost in seven years, and he lost pretty badly there. Right, just got totally outplayed. And Rady was a, a very good tactician, good positional player. He had his own ideas, problem composer. And it's funny, in the, in the articles on the internet, they say Rady was known for the, you know, the flank attack and the, you know, and, and hypermodern chess. However, before that, he didn't play like that. He was like, how many pieces can I sack? That was the old style. And then he sort of changed his mind. Now, if you like the old style, which, uh, who doesn't? There's this game with Duras from 1912, old school. And I'm sure you've all heard of Duras, right? I mean, I heard of him, but I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. In the 1980s, when I was an up-and-coming Michigan player, uh, there was a magazine called Michigan Chess. There's a magazine called Michigan Chess Now. It's got to be the worst magazine of all time. It has to be. If you're the editor, sorry, but you're not good. And it's gone downhill for the last 20 years, at least. And the editor of the magazine was David Moody, who's an A player slash expert and librarian and a good writer. And he basically wrote the magazine. And he annotated the games and everything was great. And there was a guy named Jim Kolbaki who was also an A player expert, depending on the time of day. And he would write articles occasionally on the old masters, guys that we haven't heard of from the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. And I remember Duras was one of them, because it was 40 years ago, but I remember. Yeah. And he was like, that guy played well, and then nobody believed him. So, Okay, so Rady's white, and I told you Rady played crazy. You thought I was kidding. Yeah. Gets even crazier. In fact, this reminds me of a Blitz game that my brother in the audience here beat me over 30 years ago. It was about 35 years ago. Man, I got crushed. I remember those Blitz games. Okay, now when I'm black, I play d5 here, and I play a very unusual line. In fact, d4 is even more unusual. Okay. But okay, they take on f4, knight f3, d5. I, I used to play that move too. Takes, and we develop our pieces. c4 is an unusual move, but it's okay. It's explosive. And you get this position, which doesn't really look like a king's gambit. It looks like they're playing a queen's gambit, but somehow white's f-pawn is missing. It's hard to understand. Okay, now, again, when you play the king's gambit, you're sort of exposing your king, which I guess doesn't matter here, because queen h4 is never going to happen. But the good news is we're opening up the f-file. So when white does castle, his pawn's not on f2 blocking his rook. And obviously here, white has a nice development, although his knight is pinned, and he hasn't castled yet. On the other hand, that's not the best development either. And again, I said it before in the lecture, and I'll say it every lecture, you don't have to play a boring draw if you don't want to. If you both want to, then you got no problem. If I want to play a boring draw, and so does my opponent, we're going to play a boring draw. And if we don't, we're going to play crazy chess and somebody's going to win. And it doesn't have to be that playing crazy means you're playing bad. I assume in a lot of the crazy games from the 1800s, early 1900s, the computer says equal, and then one guy doesn't know how to play chess and gets crushed. That's fair. And if you play in a style which is very interesting for the spectators, there's more decisive games. And if you're a good player, like Kasparov and Fisher and Carlson and Morphy and so forth, you can have crazy positions and win them. It doesn't matter if the peer says you're better or not. And this is such a position. Okay, rookie A check, which I would play. Bishop E5. He doesn't want to move his king. He wants to castle. He doesn't mind that his bishop is pinned because it's defended by everything. Bishop e6. What, what planet is this? So if my student played bishop e6, they're fired, and I charge them double. Yeah. So that's not a move I would consider. I would consider, like, bishop g4 pinning the knight, knight c6 developing my knight, attacking the bishop, queen a5 attacking the knight on c3. I wouldn't play those moves, but I would consider them, right? Knight g4... Okay, there's no way I would consider bishop e6. Now, I've done no preparation here, as you can tell. So let's turn the engine on. If bishop e6 is the first move, that's funny. Yeah. And bishop e6, oh, it went away. Wow, it was the first move for a second. Yeah. 
and now it, it left. And only one, only one of the moves I suggested is in here. And as you can see, I was right, it should be six, there you go. And as you can see, I was right about one thing. The condition's about equal. Okay, we're both playing crazy, we're playing King's Gambit, we're sacking our pawns, but it's equal. And Bishop E6 is still the best move. Wow. That's why that guy, they wrote an article about him, and I'm in here teaching you guys. All right. So Bishop E6 is a move I would consider, especially after playing the move Rook E8. I don't block my Rook like that. Okay, C5, because he's threatening D takes C4. Knight G4, that's the move that I liked earlier. Now we're talking. Okay, and castles. So normally, when the guy wins, the guy loses 9 10 to win the exchange, that's good for you. And you want to attack your opponent's king when these pieces are still here. The knight on f6 was obviously defending the black king, and now it's gone, so white has a lot of attack. And basically, 100, 150 years ago, when people were winning material, they just won material and hope you didn't mate them. Right? And so he took on c3, trading pieces, and knight e3. Yeah. Trading pieces is good. Okay, but this is a famous game, so that's not good for black. If black wins the exchange and wins with good technique, this game is not famous. This game is boring. But you have to have sudden judgment and then back it up with calculation. And Rady's judgment was black just lost two tempi to win the exchange, undefending his king side and leaving his pieces over here on the queen side. And basically, you could say, oh, excuse me, I'm 1,500, and even I wouldn't do that. You know why you wouldn't do that? Because when guys used to do it, they lost. And now we don't do that. See? And if you don't know games, and you're like, let's try this, and then it doesn't work, then you don't try it anymore. So grandmasters today, they're not going to lose three or four tempi and try to win an exchange and hope not to get mated. They're going to assume when the knight's coming here, the bishop's coming here, the bishop's coming here, and these pieces are here, that, that's not good. Okay, and also this doesn't make any sense anymore. Bishop on e6 blocking the rook. Boo! Okay, so bishop h7 check. Bam! Oh, snap. Now, of course, if your idea is that when you take the bishop, you can check and take the knight, no? well, the knight can retreat to f5. So Duras probably saw that, and he's like, what's the problem? He played king h8. What happens on king h7? The answer is, I assume, g4. I only assume that because of Matt Larson. He likes to play g4. Okay, let's see if I'm right. I'm hardly ever right, but I've been right before. Queen d3 check, knight f5, g4. See, I was right. And it says white's winning. Not very surprising when these pieces are here. Okay, so that's so that guy that, that wasn't so bad. Okay, now the problem is that if my student was black, I would be very mad at them for playing king h8. That breaks one of my rules, which is when they play bishop h7, you take it. King h8 doesn't ever work. When you play bishop h7 check, king h8, I bet on white. Okay, now here, black's reasoning was I'm threatening all these pieces. And you can't play queen d3 check in g4. Okay, that was his reasoning. Okay, queen d2. Attacking the knight, and now the move, this is why you paid 10 whole dollars, one of you 15, to get in this class, was so you could see this move. This was the, I waited till the end. Those other things you saw, that was worthless. Now you get your money's worth. And you don't see games like this today, because when these games happened, people who got good at chess said, I'm not doing that with black, I'm not going to play... Knight s6, knight g4, knight e3, knight f1, and leave my pieces here. Okay, so grandmasters don't do that, so you very rarely see these games. However, there was a game played today like this, between Aronian and MVL. MVL won the first game of the match, like 25 minutes. The second game, he played a Benoni, which doesn't make any sense, because he needed to draw to win the match. Benoni's a very sharp opening. Levon Aronian sacked a piece. The computer said it was equal, and then Leronian checkmated him and crushed him. Because it's hard to defend when the guy's mating you. Easy for an engine, not easy for a human. So what's the crazy, aggressive, great move that White played, which is why you paid your 10 bucks? And you better send 10 bucks in at home. Rawr! Send it to somebody, I don't know. Queen h6. Queen h6. Rawr! Yeah. So again, you know, Rady was known 
for playing the B3 and G3 and winning positional games, but this was 1912. So now he's attacking all his pieces and meeting you. The truth hurts. Generally, when you analyze games where the players are very good, they have a style, but they can win any way they want. Maybe Aronian beats you in 90 moves, then maybe the next day he beats you in 12 moves. Then the truth hurts. So I, of course, like to play as boring as possible. When my opponent falls asleep, I turn the clock and I take and then I win. But okay, if I have to sack all my pieces and win, it's an accident, then I do it. It's an accident though. Okay, Black didn't want to get checkmated, so what did he do? Resign? No, he didn't resign. He resigned later. Uh F F6, yeah. Now what's wrong with the move F6? Looking up there is not going to help you. Never. They're screaming at home. Never play F6. Yeah, they're screaming, never play F6. Yeah. So <laughs> normally I like to force my opponents to play F6 and F3 because then they lose. On the other hand, if you don't play F6, the, the truth hurts. So you better play F6. Okay. For you at home, if you defend mate this way, you're all taking the rook and then you're mating him here. That's what you're all doing at home. But I'm going here because that's mate. And also, I could have mated you by going to any of these squares, but this was much easier for me. Okay, so root g8 doesn't really work, so f6 is the best. And then queen h5, man, there's a lot of attack going on here. Now his queen's not hanging anymore. Here his queen actually is hanging. Man, that's a lot of pieces attacking you. Tough. Okay, bishop g4, tricky. See, that guy was a good player too. What happens on pawn takes? Do I play a bishop discovered check, or do I play knight g5, or do I play knight e5? Hmm. I could check on g6 and take my rook, but I'm still down a piece then. I'm starting to like knight takes e5 threatening knight g6 mate. I'm afraid if I play knight g5, he'll take it, and he'll get like seven pieces for a queen. I'm sort of worried about that. Ninety-five looks tough to me. What does what does my audience think? That looks hard to me. I think like G six is the only move, but I don't believe it. All right, so let's see. We'll, we'll turn engine on. We'll be right for once. Ninety-five is made. Nay, Bishop G six also wins. And then we just take pick on F one. That's funny. Then you just okay. I'll just take this. And white's totally winning on a rook because look at black's position. Boo! Man, this rook's over here, and the knight's coming in here, and I'm coming in there, and then these guys aren't so good. Okay, so the computer says everything wins after uh, f takes e5, but that this is forced mate. It's announcing mate. Okay, so for once I was right. Knight takes e5 was the best move. Okay, so Duras played bishop g4, and now if you play a discovered check, then I take your queen. So if you play like check or check, okay, so he takes the bishop, he takes the bishop. What's the material situation here? Anybody count? Can you do it? No? Black's up, what? A rook. Two. Black's up a rook. A rook. Yeah, yeah. Right. And now you can say, well, black's up a rook, but this is hanging. And I would say, well, this is hanging. I showed you. Okay. But when you're mating somebody and their knight's trapped and these pieces haven't moved, I bet on you. I don't care who's up what. So he just took on f1, and he knows he has enough compensation for an exchange. And if you take the bishop, you're going to get crushed. Because now you're not defending g5 anymore. So you can't, you can't let white do that, because that's just crushing. So either you're going to be up an exchange, where obviously white has enough compensation, or you're going to be up a rook and lose even worse. It's two good choices. Okay, he played knight d7. I mean, I don't believe this move. That looks, it looks like this wins, it looks like this wins. I would be totally shocked if they don't both win. Totally shocked. Knight g5, queen h5, queen f5, every move wins. Yeah. Okay, you can't, there's no defense. Okay, so knight d7. Queen h5, check. You guys can guess the next move. They're scratching their head at home, like, I don't know. King there. Okay, let's continue. Let's keep attacking. Morphy would be proud. 
because White's using all of his pieces to attack. Let's use them all more. Knight G5. Looks good to me. I like Knight G5. So if you take the bishop, then that's checkmate. So that's probably not a good move. If you take the knight, <coughs> then that's checkmate. So you can't take the bishop and you can't take the knight. So knight g5 is probably the right move. Yeah. Okay, and he played knight f8, and Bent Larson was proud. Was Bent Larson born in 1912? No, no way. 79, let's see. We saw him in 79. No, he must have been like in his 40s then. So, no. And you know why I mentioned Ben Larson, right? No? You heard of Ben Larson? Mm -hmm. Oh, he said you never get mated with a 9 on F8. But then the guy got mated with his 9 on F8. So, when he meant never, he meant except in this game. Yeah. So, let's see if there's a defense. Knight F8, wow, everything's made, so there's no defense. Knight F8 was the best. Okay, Queen F7 check. You guys can guess the next move. King Jay. Okay, now what? How do we win? What would Paul Morphy do? <laughs> Every lecture I say it, use all your pieces to attack. Which white piece isn't attacking anymore? Bishop. Yeah, you could say the bishop. Bishop's on the diagonal with the king, so that's dangerous. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the rook isn't, uh, yeah, that's not. Mm, yeah. Rook swing. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's a hard move to stop. I know you can <laughs> yeah. stop it, but it's hard. And you can stop it this way, and then you allow another mate. So, yeah. And this is funny because if you play rook f3 with the same idea, which I'm sure he saw, and I'm sure wins, he was probably like, oh, the queen could go here or here, and he could take my rook if, and, and sack his queen, and then my pieces are all hanging. So after here, he can't do that. If the guy can sack his queen for your rook, or you could checkmate him, probably checkmate him. Now, I've told this story before, so you can go do something at home. You guys haven't heard it. I'm playing a game in Michigan at the Michigan Open before you were all born. And I'm, I have a position, and I made a move, unstoppable mate. My opponent looked, and he resigned, because I'm mating him next move. Okay. And a guy came up, and he said, excuse me, in this position, he went back and moved, why didn't you go here? To, to me. And, and he said, that wins the queen. And I said, yeah, but my move is mate. And he said... Yeah, but you could have won the queen. And I said, that's correct, but my move is mate, and mate is better than winning the queen. And he said, no, it's not. You just didn't see you could win the queen. Then he walked away. <laughs> okay? So, rook f4 is mate. Rook f3 might be mate, but maybe black could give his queen away, so you don't let him give his queen away. Right? The radio was just as good as I was. Yeah. And then he took the knight, and re or maybe he resigned here, and I just made those moves. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah, so he resigned here. And I guess it's like maiden two, maiden three. Oh, knight g6, x clam. I didn't see that. Stopping rook h4. Man, <laughs> man, that's, uh, you know, if you don't like white, you're in the wrong class. Yeah. Go, go look at something else. Man. Yeah, so that was very impressive because I've heard of his opponent. Usually when I hear of somebody, they don't get beat like that. You know what I mean? Interesting, bend patiently, yeah. So um, very impressive game from Rady, not, not what he's known for. He's known for, you know, attacking from the flank and beating you positionally, as you saw in his game with Capablanca. But like any great player, he could win, you know, whatever had to be done. And I'm not the world's leading authority, and maybe my brother can weigh in, I don't know. I would guess Rady at his peak was, like, number 10 in the world? Top 10? Maybe. I'm not sure he was ever officially a, a, a GM, so I'm not sure how the ratings, you know. Yeah, but he played like a New York 24, so he was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, he played yeah. in some strong tournaments. He would probably be in the, in the top ten for maybe a brief period. Yeah. Yeah. He spent so much time composing to other things. Right, the problem is, yeah, because he was a mathematician also. The problem is, you know, nowadays when you think back, there's like ten guys you know. Even you guys know. You like have Morphe, Steinitz, Lasker, then you're like leaning alone. I don't know, right? And for some people, they never heard anybody. So if I name grandmasters or people who should have been grandmasters, my students are like, what? Who's that? And I'm like, come on. They beat the world champions. They played the world championship. I'm like, I don't know who that was. Now, obviously, if Rady had played the match for the world championship and won, then you all would have heard of him. 
Well, yeah, that world champion. So that's the purpose of this class is I know you know who the world champions are, and if you don't, that's not my fault. Like, go, go read something. But the people who are like number five, number 10, number 15 in the world, you guys are like, who's that? You can't even name them now, right? What's funny is when I started working in St. Louis seven years ago, the, the test of whether you were a really strong grandmaster was whether Mike Hummer heard of you. And now that test doesn't work anymore because it's been seven years, so Mike Hummer's heard all of them. But we would name guys number nine in the world, and Mike Hummer's like, what? Who's that? And he's an A player, B player. So we would, like, Car oh yeah, Karpov, I heard of him. That means you're famous. If I'm like Mama Jarov, he's like, what are you talking about? Who's Mama Jarov? But now he knows who it is. So now we can't do that anymore. But that was the test. If Mike Hummer heard of you, you were really good. And I'm certain that half of the lectures I give, like I did Rubenstein last week, and I did, like, Mike Hummer... Like, he might have heard of them, but it's 50-50 time, you know. So that's the point is I want people who are Class B, Class A experts, I don't want them to say, who, who's this guy who was 10th in the world? They should, you know, have some knowledge of them. So you can always look them up online. You can watch my videos, which are also online. And the best way to know who they are is to donate. Then you'll really feel like you earned your, your knowledge, right? The best way. Yeah. And come to class. I don't care where you live. My brother lives in Michigan. He's here. What's your excuse? Exactly. All right. That was Richard Rady, Rady or not. Uh, we're done. And next week, we'll talk about somebody else. See you guys tomorrow at the Blitz Tournament, right? And see you Saturday at the Game 90. Is that a better time control for you guys, Game 90? That's better than Game in five minutes. Yeah. All right. I'm out.